this point okay. um, for two reasons. One is that I've got Scott McPherson with us tonight. He is with Holyoke Media, and I wanted him to tell you what he'll be doing for our committee. So before we actually start the meeting, Scott, you're on. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so Holyoke, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so what Holyoke Media is gonna do, Sue Ellen and I, um, uh, met the week before Christmas and just walked through. We're going to ensure that all of these meetings are recorded and um, we will take them and broadcast them back on channel 15 here in town and we'll also convert them and pop them up on YouTube with the meeting agenda so that they can be available for anybody to watch on demand uh, at any time that they, they would like. And th those are preserved up there. Um, I, I don't have a specific time horizon but until YouTube tells us we can't. <laughs> so as long as that means. <laughs> There's no cutting. Okay. okay. Are there any questions for Scott from anybody on the committee? No, I'll okay. just add that he does do that for the Community Preservation Act Committee. He does a great job and it's, and I find it to be very valuable to be able to go back and look at the videos and review the meeting, so. Well, um, Scott handles all of the uh, the city's work of, of this nature, and uh, I just wanted him to be here in case anybody had any questions for him at the beginning. He's going to have to hop out to get ready for the uh, city council meeting at some point. Yeah. Um, and I just found that um, we have Aaron Vega with us now. And Terry Shepard is with us now. Hmm. So I want you both in and I want to make sure your mics are unmuted so you can chime in uh, as needed. One of the first things I wanted to do, and I am making a terrible assumption here, that everybody has read not only the quick minutes I did, but the minutes that um, Jeff Anderson Burgos did for us because I'd like you to talk for a minute very briefly about which style of minutes you want. As you know, the meeting will be reported, it'll be in the cloud. There really is no ne necessity that I know of legally for the long, long minutes. And it seems like it will be a redundancy and an awful lot of work. Plus, we're all volunteers. Say again, Hi, Marlene. Marlene, what did you say? I said, plus, we're all volunteers. So um, we should do our best to do the, um, a complete but modest job of recording the thoughts and the conversation and not have to overdo not overdo it the meetings are recorded anyway right right and we were going to take turns this meeting is kips anybody you, else Kip. have any thoughts about the minutes okay now when we get to the point that we'll be asking uh, the public, if they have any comments on anything. Uh, Marlene is going to be in charge of um, handling the um, muting people if they go too long. We don't want to have lengthy commentaries, but we do want to get everybody's opinion in briefly. So we'll set up length of time people can talk on an as needed basis. Is that all right with everybody? Yes. And, and okay. I think it's, it, you know, to assist in that process, everybody that's on the phone, um, everybody that attends the meeting should um, be directed to sign in on the, via the chat box. And so we'll have a record of who is attending meetings and um, when we set up the agendas, um, we should either or 
the the intent would be to set up a specific agenda item which would uh, give a time when people would be allowed to contribute uh, to the conversation and the other thing that we can do is when people um, when uh, the public wants to contribute or, or ask a question um, if you look on the participant side of the uh, uh, zoom process if you click on that there is a feature that allows somebody to raise their hand and rather than um, have somebody just break in and ask a question if somebody wants to address the committee they can uh, let some, let us know via the function of raising their hand and we will know then who they are and that they want to contribute something when they want to contribute something so we want to try to manage this as best as we can recognizing tonight there's just a few of us but there might be other meetings when there'll be more people in attendance okay um now if there are any notifications to the committee i'm going to try to get them out by zoom uh, i have everybody's email at this point and i will email as necessary to let everybody know about meetings. I haven't gotten quite clever enough to do reminders, but I'll get that figured out. Uh, is there anything else in the way of housekeeping that anybody wants to discuss now and uh, get out of the way? And then we're going to go directly to our guests. Uh, David Conti is with us, and he will be talking about the Whiting Street Reservoir and the plans that the water department has had for its use and he'll be available to ask questions so any other housekeeping things then i will ask uh, dave moore to introduce dave conti oh, thank you sue uh, i would like to introduce uh dave conti longtime general manager of the water department i had we've had a long long good relationship. We had a great meeting with Joe Mansey down at the water works and uh, he, uh, there was no persuading. He was, he looked forward to coming here and, and uh, explaining as much as he possibly can to the committee. So without any further friendship together, go to it, Mr. Conti. Good evening. Um, can you hear me? Is my mic on? Yes. Yeah, Dave. Um, well, yeah. Uh, Dave Moore asked me, um, to attend the Zoom meeting um, for the purpose of kind of bringing your committee up to speed as to what's taking place out at the uh, the Whiting Street Reservoir as far as the improvements that are that are currently underway. And um, what we are in the process of doing right now is we are going to be upgrading the spillway um, so that it meets the one half PMF requirement uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers, which is comparable to a thousand year storm event. And um, the cost of those improvements um, are in the order of $2.4 million. And what essentially we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be reconstructing the existing spillway, which is um, approximately 33 feet in length. And we are going to extend it northerly uh, for a, a total length of 110 feet. So you're gonna see a significant removal of the, of the uh, stone masonry structure to accommodate the larger spillway. And then there's going to be a discharge channel. It's going to discharge into the uh, the current um, uh, relief area, which is um, downstream or easterly of the dam. That spillway um, will be uh, constructed at uh, an elevation two feet lower than the current spillway in order to meet uh, three feet of freeboard. Um, and the reason we want three feet of uh, freeboard, no, no, more, no, uh, no less than three feet, Three feet of freeboard is if we were to reduce the freeboard any further we would have to extend the dam of uh, the spillway uh, structure further so which is which is considerable cost given the um, the amount of concrete so that project right now is in the um, is in the uh, design stages and the permitting process uh, we anticipate that project will be going out to bid around this time next year 2021 2022 with construction starting in 22 and completion somewhere around 23. So that is what's taking place as far as um, 
the improvements that we have planned for that particular reservoir. Its current status is uh, emergency standby. Um, we have a station that the um, um, Department of Environmental Protection asked us to re rehabilitate. That's the uh, the pump house that you see down by um, at the corner of the road. Um, they wanted us to have that facility available in the ever, in the event we had to put that source into operation, which could be done relatively quickly in the event of um, a loss of the other water supplies in the southerly portion of the city. So that work was done. We have a, a plan in progress how to, to institute that uh, particular uh, reservoir, the process that would take place in the event of a, uh, of a water shortage or an emergency. So that's in place. Um, other, thing, other than that, uh, currently uh, activities that are permitted around the reservoir, passive recreational activities, um, walking, jogging, and bicycling. And um, that is pretty much what the board felt comfortable with as far as um, permitted uses. Any other questions do you have uh, with regards to the capacity of the reservoir? Would you like more information regarding that or the yield? That would be that would be uh, beneficial, I think, David. Okay. Um, so the uh, the city owns about uh, 250 acres around that reservoir. I think 110 acres are are water surface. Uh, that's that's um, very well protected. Uh, it, there is the the watershed extends beyond that. There there is a lot of um, endangered species around that reservoir, specifically on the westerly side, westerly and southerly side. You have the copperhead rattlesnakes. Uh, you have a, a number of other endangered species that um, National Heritage has identified around those around that area. It's a pretty difficult area to navigate on the on the westerly side. Uh, the reservoir currently has an impound of just under a half a billion gallons, 479 million gallons. That impound will be slightly decreased as a result of the new spillway elevation. It should be down around 450, uh, 450 million gallons, and the reservoir has a yield of uh, 1.6 million gallons per day. One of the things the board would like to do, and one of the reasons why the board is upgrading the spillway is because the current spillway does not mean meet the half uh, PMF um, storm event, which I originally uh, spoke of. The dam is classified as a large dam, and it is a high hazard dam, meaning that if there was ever a failure of that of that dam structure, there would be loss of life, loss of life, and significant um, uh, damage to. Uh, uh, Interstate 91. So that's one of the concerns, and that's one of the reasons why that the current spillway doesn't even meet the 500-year storm event. And that's the reason why I don't know if you noticed this, but we typically draw the um, the reservoir down about two feet below the um, the crest of the spillway. So in the event of a storm, which we've had a couple of storm events that were close to 500-year. We don't have um, overtoppling of the dam structure, which is it's a masonry structure with earth and fill behind it. But um, in the event of overtoppling that dam could potentially cause the failure of that structure. Uh, other information um, with regards to um, the water supply, uh, it is on emergency standby. I mean, the commission would like to keep that reservoir as a source uh, for future use. We see a lot of communities around uh, Hoyoke that have groundwater sources. And I'm sure everybody is aware with all the new contaminants that are being identified uh, in groundwater specifically, which a lot of the communities that border Hoyoke are groundwater sources. You may see the possibility of that reservoir being used to supply other communities. So. They're not creating any new sources. Uh, the commission is committing to protecting and preserving that water supply and the, uh, the land that surrounds it. Are there any other questions for Dave? You know, I think it's probably pretty obvious to all of us that Holyoke has two truly remarkable resources. The major one is our water supply. And the water department has been doing an incredible job of making 
walking paths available to the public at those <laughs> reservoirs. And I think Dave has also clearly stated that he doesn't feel that anything other than very passive recreation is appropriate to the land. I'm wondering about the recharge of the reservoir too, David. Um, is most of it from the northwesterly side? Yes, yes. Primarily from the northwesterly side. We don't get a, a lot of contribution from the southerly end, mostly like you said, northwesterly side. As far as, as far as, I mean, there was, uh, when I had a conversation with Dave Moore, there were actually, we had the conversation about if there was any land that could be considered developable and the only parcels or area of land that, not, not that the board would consider this, but if, if that was something that was to be looked at, it would be in the southerly portion of the reservoir, talking adjacent to, uh, adjacent to 141 alongside of the um the golf course that's pretty much the only area that could potentially be developed that doesn't have um the endangered species or the wetlands uh or the drainage or the drainage streams that contribute to that water supply it's a pretty difficult area to develop i'm sure you're aware of oh yeah <laughs> oh, you had a question yep did you have a question I did, and I think Dave partially answered it. I was just going to ask um, Dave if they have identified any potential risks to the watershed, and I guess uh, you know maybe the answer is exclusively that potentially developable land. But I wonder if there's and and Dave, you guys control that land. You own that land that potentially could be developed. Is that correct? That's correct. And are you aware of any other abutting land that represents a risk to the water quality of that recharge area? N nothing that, that we have concerns could be developed. Okay. Uh, the, the ski area does, does drain, a portion of the ski area does drain into that water supply. I think there's a, and I'm not sure about it, uh, and, Dave Moore and I had this conversation about the, the there's a, a pond up above uh, Whiting Street, but I'm not sure which way that drains. Uh, he would be more familiar with that particular uh, that particular area than I am. But as of right now, we're not aware of any known contaminants um, to the to the surface water supply. Dave, some years ago, there was a uh, very extensive study done of Mount Tom itself and um, the wetland areas on the mountain. Do you have a copy of that or would, um, would we get that solely from the Conservation Commission? I, I, don't have, I don't have that particular information. I do have a, um, um, Inspection evaluation report coming coming out uh, in February for the Whiting Street Reservoir that identifies that has gives some general information with regards to the reservoir when it was constructed, uh, deficiencies that are noted um, during the evaluation inspection, and because it's a it's classified as a high hazard uh, dam, we are required to conduct these inspections evaluations every two years. So I do have that report coming out in February. I could make that report available to this committee. That'd be great. That'd be terrific. Uh, Marcos, you're on mute, but you have a question. Hi, uh, thank you. And sorry, everybody, for being a little bit late. Uh, Dave, how you doing? Um, Hi, Marcos. <laughs> hey, uh, you may have already talked about this while I was out. Um, in terms of the passive recreation that exists there now, what in your, um, in, in, in your view or best practices, does that have an upper limit? I mean, it, it must at some point, right? I mean, it, between what you have there now and, you know, running a parade through there, like what, what in your mind is, is kind of the upper limit of, of tolerance, if you will, for that, uh, for that area? Like, could this easily be doubled or tripled without any significant concern, right? Like, I don't know if there's any existing impact that the water department has seen in terms of, you know, people throwing candy wrappers around, right? Like, I, I, I don't know if there's any 
um, anything there. It was just really immaterial. People just walk and they leave. Well, well, we have seen uh, a significant significant increase in activity uh, around the reservoirs as a result of COVID. I'm sure you're aware that we the, the commission kept the reservoirs open to the general public um, during the pandemic, and uh, because uh, that was important to them, that they provided that uh, resource to the community. And as a result of that, we had to step up our patrolling. We did uh, employ the Department of Environmental Police to patrol those that not only the Whiting Street but also the Ashley and McLean uh, water supplies. Um, there was uh, an increase. An increase. We noted an increased number of, uh, in, in trash. So we, we put some additional uh, barrels out there, and we also had to increase the um, the frequency of the uh, the sandy can um, uh, maintenance. Uh, because of all the activity. So we did see, it, it has calmed down now because it's the winter months, but uh, we should see a spike again in, in activity around that water supply. So uh, what's the up, upper limit? I mean, right now our insurance is pretty specific as to um, what is permissible activities. I mean, you can't have any kind of uh, watercraft or boats on that, on that, on the water supply. I mean, we are allowed just the boat that we have for patrolling the shorelines. And we do that with all the water supplies. Uh, but as far as uh, public use of the water, uh, that's not permitted. So uh, what else could I see as far as limits that we can handle? We, we, we have a difficult time handling what we're handling now with, 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 with our staff. And remember, this is just one of you know four sources. Um, and we got a, quite a bit of activity around the Ashley. It's a much larger supply. And then the, as you're aware, the McLean Reservoir is off limits to the general public because it is an active source and it plays a role in, in the city's water supply on a daily basis. So um, with what we have, with the resources we have, I would say that we are pretty much at our limit as to what board would permit. Sure. No, I totally understood. I, I, the upper limit, I... I, I I should have qualified this. I meant in terms of impact to the water. I mean, the staffing is a, is a is a resource question, which you know I think generally the commission is charged with looking at what value could be taken from uh, provided from the reservoir in other ways, whether it's recreation, and if that creates income streams, then obviously that would have to pay for some other stuff like that. I don't think the, uh, I'll speak for myself. I don't think it would be reasonable to put on the water department to to. To, to do more policing of a recreational <laughs> facility. I think that that that's part of, you know, if and when you get there, you have to create the business plan for that. Um, you mentioned insurance for watercraft, um, clearly an, an important uh, restriction, right? If you're not gonna be insured for anything that would happen on the reservoir, um, you know, and, that, and ultimately that, that may be a cost issue as well. I wonder for environmental impact, right? The impact to the water quality, to your option to, of using the Whiting Reservoir in the future as a water source. Do you see any particular problem, insurance aside, with having any types of, of um, passive watercraft on, on the on the reservoir, right? Like paddle boats, stuff like that. Not, not anything with an engine, anything that can leak uh, hydrocarbons or anything like that? Well, per personally, I mean, it's, it's really pretty much from a liability standpoint. I mean, it's, it's not an active source right now. It's, it's on standby. So um, when that, if, if and when that reservoir is activated, which I really believe it will be someday in the future. I mean, they're not creating new sources of water certainly. And again, you have a lot of communities that surround uh, this area that have looked at. I mean, we there was a study done uh, about 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. The MWRA was looking at augmenting South Hadley's water supply with the Whiting Street Reservoir. So there, there were discussions back then. Um, how do I feel about, how do I feel about, you know, it's just, it's just, we, we allow, with, with more recreational activities allowed you create more problems, just like the, the passive recreational activities we have now. We are having we have difficulty controlling the uh, motor vehicles out there, uh, people out there with dogs. I know a lot of people believe you know they don't see the issue with it, and um, 
but um, unfortunately the state does. <laughs> they do. And, uh, you know, with, with allowing the activities that we allow, I mean, there is always that potential for contamination. You know, you have people out there in paddle boats, if they're out there with you, throwing their bottles in the water, they drink, bring their drinking water, they bring their food, you know, there's always that potential, you know, unless somebody is out there to, to regulate this. And, and again, and again, we don't have uh, the resources. We don't have the resources to do that. So. Thank you. Were there any other questions for David from the committee? So I guess David, oh, go ahead here. Uh, David, uh, when you said they're going to be uh, doing the, uh, the dam over in 2022, will that prohibit anybody from using it during that construction period? They, there will be, there, I'm sure there will be areas of the reservoir that will be off limits to the public due to the construction equipment. I would, I believe, and, and again, I'm not sure at this point in time, I, I don't know um, the logistics as to um, where, the, where the, uh, the construction equipment is going to access the reservoir, whether it's off of 141 or if it's off of Mountain Road. Um, there is going to be a considerable, considerable amount of construction activity. I mean, just we're talking, you know, when they actually start pouring the structure, hundreds of concrete trucks uh, coming into that reservoir. So I would believe that when that does happen, that the reservoir, I don't assume that the commission will be shutting the reservoir down, but there will be areas that will be horsed off and the public will not be permitted to, uh, to access those areas. So I don't think you're going to be able to maintain that loop around the reservoir, if that's what you're asking me. Yeah, so fine. people will be able to walk up to somewhere in, in close proximity to that spillway. But again, we don't, I don't know about, you know, where you know we haven't gotten that far yet as to where they're going to be accessing the the reservoir uh, from which access point and um, the amount of traffic and how that's going to affect the public but I'm sure the commission is going to do everything they possibly can to keep as much of that reservoir open to the general public and one one more if I may um, you we were talking about endangered species is that going to probably prohibit any future you know paths or walking paths biking trails to go through there because of all the the problems on the west side well we have we have designated paths and trails now we, we have noticed that uh, a lot of mountain bikers have been creating their own paths and this this is not just a problem with with us it's been a problem with other landowners considering uh, considering uh quab and one of the larger landowners um they're having a lot of problems with uh, the increased bike activity and the, the creation of all these new trails that are happening. So they, um, from my understanding is, and we were having this conversation that they, they are uh, enforcing, uh, they, they've hired some additional police that are enforcing or prohibiting the creation of new trails. But we've seen that, we've seen new trails be uh, being created as a result of you know, all these, these um, mountain bikes now and these new e-bikes that people are using. So um, we're, we're trying to limit stuff like that from happening, but it's very difficult to police that with, with what we have with our staff. But we try, what we do is we encourage people to use the trails that currently exist and not, not create any further trails around the water supply. Thank you. 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 Yes, very good. So, um, David, uh, when or how would we be able to get a copy of the um, inspection evaluation report? When I, I should have it in February, I will se I will send it to you. Want me to sell it? Send it to Mrs. Panich's uh, email address because sure. I have it. You know now. what I think would be best, actually, if you would get it to uh, Jeff Anderson Burgos, okay, City Hall. He'll okay. add it to the uh, folder that he had set up for us. Okay. We have a, a, an on-screen uh, file that we can access. And if he can get it into that, then we will be able to, all of us, access it very easily and readily. 
So that would be perfect. Okay, I will do that. And, and just, just to go back on uh, Mr. Craven's point, when we get to that point before construction, I'm sure we will have notices posted. We will notify the general public. We should have our new website up and running and we'll be, there'll be information on the website as to when the construction will take place and where will the access points be, uh, where will the areas where the construction, will, where, where uh, pedestrian traffic will be prohibited. So we'll be working on all that prior to that construction starting. Well, thank you very much for spending the time with us. We really appreciate it. Good to see you. It was nice to and, see you too. Um, it's good to know what the thinking is of the water department and the water commissioners. And I think we've heard that pretty loud and clear. <laughs> thank you for having me on. And anytime uh, you need me to attend any of your meetings, just feel free to reach out to me. Okay, we will notify you by email of all Zoom meetings that we feel that uh, it would be helpful for you to be at. Thank you okay. for the offer. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Timothy. Thanks, David. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, Jeff, are you there anywhere, Jeff Horan? I am. Can you not see me? I can yeah. now. <laughs> um, Jeff, I'm sure you remember that major um excuse me one minute somebody's at the door <laughs> uh, i'm upstairs and i don't think they can hear me uh there was a major review done of mount tom and all the water um areas screens and so forth do you think that would be helpful for this committee and should that be added to our folder yeah, so I, I expect so first of all that was before my time. So I think that was done in 2010 and 2011 and I enjoyed joined the commission in 2013, but it was a major review as you it took out, us about so. a year and a half. Yeah, and so um yeah, I suspect that would be helpful. It was a again, it was a very significant review. It has a lot of um what I suspect would be very useful information. If I, if I might, Sue, I was hired by uh, the Gas and Electric to be to give some information to, and work up there for a bit in those years ago. And Ty and Bond was the the act the actual uh, per, the actual group that did that study, and I'm sure it's still available. Well, I know that it's available in the Conservation Commission records. Um, Ty and Bond, you're right, David. Ty and Bond did the study. Yeah. Uh, and if I think long enough, I'll remember the name of the person who actually did the work. Um, it was an Irish name. But um, if Jeff could access that for us and get it to um, Jeff Anderson uh, Burgos, we could also get that into our folder and everybody would have the uh, benefit of being able to skim over it. It is a lengthy, carefully documented study. And it went back to Ty and Bond at least seven or eight times for updates and additional information since a lot was left out at the beginning of doing the work. And I'm wondering, having brought that one up, are there any other studies that have been done in the past that anyone would suggest we get a look at now? Or has anyone heard of anything that's been done? Dave, do you know of anything that was done up on the uh, ski slope? You know, yeah, that's just it, what we did many, we had different things that we did to try to contemplate combining mountain park uh, the reservoir, Wyckoff Golf Course, the reservation, but it, it, it's, it's ancient history, I, I'd be afraid, okay, that uh, it, it, it's too old, what, it, it, was a, it was a great idea, but it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't worthy of, of digging it up, okay. Okay. Now, how would everybody feel about asking the law department to come in and talk to us about the various legal 
uh, ramifications of the use of the land, uh, everything from rental to sales to conservation um, issues. Although I think Jeff could probably give us all of the background on conservation law that we need. Mr. Horan, am I taking your name in vain? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm just trying to see what we need for background material before we get started on the um, specifics of ideas. Well, as you as you point out, I do think that the Mount Tom study is one of the, one of those things. I don't, you know, as, um, I will just say I was surprised to hear Dave Conti say that there, you know, had been no discussion of not doing the work. At, you know, it seemed like the this commission, this committee even being put together was partially promulgated based on, you know, some concern that we weren't they weren't going to do that two point four million dollars worth of work on the spillway. So I just found that interesting statement. Good to know. Yep. Do you want to talk about the conservation restrictions or would you like to do that? So conservation year. restrictions on the, so Suan, can you rephrase the question again? I'm sorry. If I, well, the general conservation restrictions on land around a water body, uh, land use, um, I don't know how else to put it. No, no. So there, so, right. So, so any lands that are, are bodies of water like that reservoir um, or wetlands, um, perennial streams or uh, ephemeral streams would all have, would all have restrictions um, related to uh, the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act. And they, um, for instance, the water around the water body that would likely have a 200 foot uh, restriction um, right up front. And, you know, very little could be done within, it would be restricted along that. Any wetlands, the restrictions would be um, very strict within 50 feet of any wetland and would, would require even a variance to do any of that work. And then within 100 feet would have um, significant restrictions as well. So that's just a, a thumbnail. Obviously, there are, is a great deal more that could be addressed, but obviously there would be restrictions there. and and um, and of course, any of the uh, endangered species issues are brought into the conversation by any request for a permit for any type of construction that would impact a jurisdictional wetland. So is there I don't think there's any new information to people there, but that's just a quick thumbnail. Is there an endangered species report somewhere or inventory or something for that location? Not that I'm aware of. Um, there was, again, this project was, uh, this project was just, we were given a courtesy uh, indication that there was gonna be work there. So they took it, so we, so we went out to the site and they discussed what was gonna be done, but there was no filings or anything. So I had looked back in, into that, uh, Sue Ellen, at your request, and, and I, we have not found any actual, and I don't think there were filings. So there's been no work that I'm aware of um, related to any permit activity in recent times there. But so Alan, you may be aware of, of past activities, but I will say in relation to Marlene's question, question the, all of the endangered species that would be that, or, or most of those that would be of consideration here would have been addressed in that Mount Tom study for the most part. So that will be a very significant basis. Right? Again, it's just, it's just chock full of information. Um, and so that will be helpful to us. In, uh, or Jeff, I don't know if you would know the answer to this, but in either the Mount Tom report or the evaluation report that the Water Commission has, is there a map somewhere that shows the reservoir, the surrounding land, 
the size, who own, you know, ownership of all those parcels. Does that exist anywhere? Yes. We, yes, it's accessible to all of us. Go ahead, Marcos. I'll. I'll uh... <laughs> well, we we uh, the city has a property viewer. I will I will uh, put the direct link on on the chat here, uh, but it, it should be accessible through Holyoke.org. Um, okay. It's maintained by the, the 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 data backing it up is maintained by the city city assessor's office. Um, the 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 GIS software itself and its and its operation is maintained by the Office of Planning and Economic Development. So you can you can click on any property and see who the owner is, how big it, it is, you know, the acreage and stuff like that. So the descriptions that that Dave Conti was was providing, you can see you, not real time, right? It's, it's not a live feed, but you could you could see it on the map um, and orient yourself with with different layers, you know, from um, some of the some of the restrictions that that Jeff is talking about in terms of uh, water quality, they're, they're there, you know, zoning. Uh, wards, you know, whatever. I'll paste that in here in a second. Thank you. And, and the state also has uh, what they call a biomap, which would um, give you some indication of where some endangered species, what they would call review areas are for endangered species. It doesn't tell you what species is there, for instance, because that because there's concerns about having that information public. And it's not a specific, you know, the polygons, for instance, are review polygons. It's not an exact location of where they are, but the, but the state does maintain that biomap and it is helpful, but it doesn't give you all the information. Thank you. Morally in the Mount Tom study that was done uh, does map the entire mountain. Okay. And I'm sure that the water department will have maps of the reservoir. Yeah, because I think, you know, all the discussions about, you know, different types of uses or ideas that people are going to want to have us think through, we should understand conceptually how that might fit, might not fit, might work, might not work, things like that. Uh, so a question to the group. When you mentioned the Mount Tom study, which, which study in particular is this one? Is this the one done by the Conway School? It was done um, by Ty and Bond for the entire mountain. And heaven help me, I don't remember who requested that it be done. I think it was, no, I can't, I can't. Uh, can't pull Swell, and wasn't it that. related to the tower constructions? Absolutely, that's exactly what it was, okay. It, the right. gas and electric wanted to provide a road, a different road uh, up to the tower that exists up there now, and it, it kicked that study in. The gas and electric paid for part of it. Uh, that's how I got involved in it. So for what it's worth, um, a couple of years ago, uh, in 2016, um, there was a Mount Tom study uh, done by the Conway School of, um, what's the full name, Landscape Architecture. Um, and it was looking at the, you know, the fractured ownership and, and, and usage of the area. So I just put in the chat the, the link to that. It's about 75 pages long. So it, it does look at the ecology and stuff like that. I'm, I'm sure it's not as, <laughs> as uh, specific as the tie and bond study. Um, they're not engineers, but they were looking at it in terms of, it's kind of like a, like a light planning study and, and landscape design. So they're, they're, it, it may be useful for as background to this group. It, it, it looks pretty useful. Thanks for sharing that, Marcus. There's, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're at a point where we need to talk about what direction we're going to go in for moving forward. And uh, I am more than open to hear from everybody. Hello? 
your thoughts. Yeah, my thoughts was I was I was muted. <laughs> um, we are charged with the you know Whiting Street Reservoir, uh, but should we also be looking from you know the the Oxbow all the way down to Bear Hole as part of what the future of the city is going to do with all all of this land that we haven't screwed up yet? Um, Let's try not to. Yeah, so I, you know, are we, you know, we're certainly gonna be more concerned with the reservoir, but I think, you know, we ought to also look at the whole uh, area uh, of uh, the ridge and the mountain. Uh, and, you know, who knows where we're gonna go with it, but I think uh, there's options there that's gonna help uh, the whole uh, value, uh, there's areas where something can be developed. Uh, you know, you got uh, the Mount Park parcel that, you know, what's gonna happen with that, that certainly can be developed. Uh, do we wanna do that? Uh, do we have any say in it? Uh, and the two uh, golf courses, uh, those, those are areas that can produce some income, I would guess. Um, just throwing that out there. I would, um, go ahead. Hey, Terry, why don't you, Terry, go ahead. Time to talk, Terry. <laughs> hey, everybody, I've, I've met most of you. I'm Terry Shepard from Park and Rec. Um, I guess I don't know what the charge of this committee is in general. Um, it, what is our purpose and what happens? Do we come up with recommendations? Where does it go? I guess what are we doing? because I don't know. The, well, it's um, unfortunate that you missed the first meeting. I did and, read the minutes. And um, basically everything that we are charged with is in the, the minutes. Yep. Um, Mike Sullivan spoke specifically to what our charge is. And that was basically to take a look at Whiting Street Reservoir yep. its, and its future in the city. What could or could not be developed what type of recreational use it might have, whether okay. the water could be sold and so on and so forth. But I, I got really confused and I did read that and I thought, hmm, is, is all of that property owned by the water department? Um, do they yeah. have a final say? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. On the reservoir, they, they own the reservoir property, but not, not everything around it. Okay. And all we were told to look at, or all we are charged to look at, is the reservoir and its property. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. Uh, Ma Madam Chair, if I may, I, I, I would echo uh, what Harry Craven has said uh, in, in, in the following sense. I think what we're not the water commission so we can't really determine everything that <laughs> that could be done from a from a water provision perspective um and we don't um so 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 there's certain things that are exogenous to us right um there there's a potential for some usage um uh for enhancing some of the uses of the, of the reservoir at this time but it's most likely to make sense in a in a in a larger vision. I think, um, as Terry just brought up, the, does the water department control some of the other land? Uh, that's that's well, it controls a lot of land, but it doesn't control a lot of the abutting land. Um, as Dave Conti said earlier, you know, one of the things they struggle with is the vehicles that are there. Uh, there's some abutting land that would be more practicable for for parking. There, there, there are continuously plans in place for other development projects or, or, or outdoor recreation projects nearby. And so the question on what we could do with Whiting may be very, very, uh, or the answer to that question may be very narrow and marginally very little, but in the broader context may be significant, right? If there's an enhancement to um, what other partners are doing there. Right. Public Gas and Electric owns a significant amount of land. There's a private party that owns a significant amount of land, the Boys and Girls Club, and the federal government and the Commonwealth. 
And so it's how do these pieces come together? I think there are eight or nine critical landowners. How could they come together with Whiting Reservoir at the center with either the use that it has now or the use slightly enhanced? Because what, what I think we heard from Dave Conti, at least what I caught at the end, is we don't think that there could be a lot more at the reservoir. <laughs> And so unless we're going to independently verify that with, with, with other experts, um, then, then I, I think we start becoming limited on, on what, we, what we're looking at. As well, I think the charge that we have based on what the city council has asked us to do is quite limited. Uh, I think that it, it would probably be very reasonable for us to take a look at the surrounding properties, see what they're doing and make note of that in the final report. But as far as um, looking at more than the specific charge that we have is concerned, I think we would be stepping way out of the boundaries that are, have already been set for us. I agree. Honestly, I couldn't went just from reading the minutes and the material I had. I couldn't determine if there was any tie in with the upgrades that are going to happen there that the water department will be doing. I didn't know if there was a tie in to get more public input or more recreational usage. There's absolutely no tie into that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. It just that we needed to know what was going on with the water department, what their thinking is and what their plans are before we moved on to do anything else. Okay. I, I do think it does uh, bring into question the, the charge. I think there was some misinformation that was out there previously. And, and you know, if you, you know, listening to Dave's presentation, um, it's hard to understand why we would um, do a major, study of this area and the options when it, it sounds like the, um, the water department knows exactly what they want to do and they would limit um, the use pretty extensively. I might be hearing things wrong. Again, I, I, I know, I, you know, I probably know less about, um, you know, uses that have gone on on that reservoir than anyone um, here, but uh, you know, there's a lot, obviously the area surrounding the reservoir, there is tremendous activity and tremendous uh, potential impacts and tremendous interest. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, although I think we have to be very careful about expanding the charge of this, this group, and I'm not sure we necessarily can, I think it's worth discussing, you know, the value, I mean, or, you know, we came, we were, we were appointed to this um, group, you know, for a certain thing. It seems like there's some, it seems to me that there's limited options that are likely to come out of a detailed study. And I'm just curious what others think about that. And Harry has put on the table, considering a broader charge, I just think it's worth talking about, but I, I think we would have to take steps uh, to get uh, additional permission if we were even going to consider that type of approach. But it is something that the state might be willing to fund, for instance, because they have tremendous interest in, in uh, the area immediately surrounding. So I, I just think we ought to discuss it. I'm not sure. I don't know what I'm in favor of, to be quite honest, but I think it should be discussed. Well, essentially, I I don't think as a chairman I'm allowed to say this, but I'm going to anyway. I completely agree with you. Uh, we might want to take a look at what is going on and allowed at surrounding properties and see what their impact is on the reservoir. But more than that, I, I just, uh, I don't think it lies within the purview set forth for us. That That was why I was thinking about the the, you know, just looking at a, at a map to see, you know, how it all fits together and what the, um, what the uses are and what the activity is and how there is or isn't a relationship between the reservoir and these other places. Because I think, you know, 
contextually, if you're, tr you know, thinking about the reservoir, you're not, you can't think about it in isolation because it, there's just too much impact by the neighbor. There's impact from neighboring uses and um, abutting properties, and we should understand how those impact the reservoir. I think. Yeah. Is is there a study at Marcos? Has there been a study done of the of the, the general Mount Tom area for or, you know other than the study you pointed out that was the Conway School that was done on their own merit? I don't know that anyone um, sanctioned that. Yeah, um, we we haven't we haven't commissioned a study for the reuse of, of like the entire I should say reuse or the coordinated use for the entire area. Um, it was something that I was trying to do with um, some limited resources that we were provided um, through the gaming commission. Um, we we ultimately used uh, a portion of of those gaming commission funds to do a tourism plan uh, for Holyoke. Um, the, the money didn't go uh, uh, further enough to be able to have a more focused scope, which was <laughs> what, I, what I wanted to do, have, have a couple of, uh, digging deep in a couple of specific areas of tourism, kind of like how, how would you make something more specific happen in a few years? One of them was, was Mount Tom. Um, a couple of years ago, I tried to initiate a conversation uh, between the city and several of the parties that had been meeting, several of the abutting parties, um, some of the some of the private owners um, and institutional owners, um, uh, you know, con conservation organizations that, that have a stake there, um, because they do on occasion talk to each other, they have common access, um, but it's not. Um, if you're just a visitor to the area, it's not necessarily well coordinated, right? It's not it's not well marketed. The signage, you know, where do you park, and stuff like that. So, um, long story short, the 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 hope was that we 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 got nowhere near that, right? If you if you were to see this document, this tourism plan, you know, it basically has a recommendation saying it would be great to see how all these assets could come together. Well, sure, <laughs> it's too high level. Um, I could I could provide that to the group. I don't think it will be tremendously helpful. I think that what the Conway School did uh, is a little bit more helpful. I was interviewed for that for that study, and I and I and I kind of tried also pushing them in that direction. So uh, there's a little bit of that flavor there um, in that in that study. Anyone else? I'd be happy to get in touch with the law department and see if somebody from the law department wants to come and come and attend our next session, see if there's any um, questions or things we need to understand with in, in that respect. Do you all if, feel that would be helpful? If you think that's helpful. Couldn't do a bit of harm. That's very true. And and would we suggest that they at least uh, address um, uh, current status of of the adjacent properties? Again, I'm not. Look, it's there's fraught. It's fraught with. I mean, all you have to do is look across the street and consider. You know, there's a proposal for a Dunkin' Donuts, and there's you know there's the Edna Williams property. You know, there's that whole area. There's a and again, it's all controversial. You know, we're sticking our nose into places. Dunkin' that... Donuts, where? <laughs> no. In the lower <laughs> parking lot of the Delaney house. And you're right. No. No. But but it does call again. So so again, these are very these are sensitive things, and yes, you know, they're very going to have going to have impacts on people. But I mean, part of the issue is because there's no broader plan for that. There's no, there's nothing been thought out, you know, for, you know, wh what does Holyoke want for this property and these, this tremendous resource it has in the long term. But that is a, you know, that's, that's a big undertaking and it is not what the council uh, told us to go do. And 
<laughs> yep, we could get in trouble here. Yes. <laughs> It's certainly, there certainly are a lot of parcels of land that surround the reservoir. And I think if we were going to make a list of them, chime in everybody, we'd have the Eric Sewer property where he has his outdoor amphitheater, which is immediately adjacent. Then we have Mount Tom itself, and the access road up to the memorial for the airplane crash, Mount Tom, the quarry property, uh, the Mount Tom reservation. Below it, there's property owned by the uh, trustees of reservation. Yep. There are a couple of um, connecting um, storm lines that go under Route 5 and it drains eventually to the Connecticut River, both above and below the Trustees of Reservation Dinosaur Tract site. If we keep going up the road, of course, we're going to run into the Oxbow, which is in East Hampton, and um, into the marina. Yep. Have I missed I, any property? Um, I, I, yeah, on the, on the top of the mountain and, and the access road to it is the, the broadcasting company. Right. The uh, big piece. Right. The Hoyle Country Club as well. Yep. And Wyckoff. Wyckoff. Wyckoff is significant because it, it really, they're all, they're all contingent. Right. And the US, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, of course, owns little more the quarry area in, in the area where the monument is yeah. yeah well i mean my my two cents would be um it's difficult to look at just the reservoir in a vacuum i do think you need to look at at least the abutting properties and maybe significant properties that aren't just the butters and not I don't think to come up with a master plan for all of those properties, but, you know, to understand the relationship between those properties and the reservoir. And I think that's within our purview. That's, and that's what I, I think Harry was right. I think that we need to understand all of that. If we're going to do a fair assessment and think through recommendations that have some basis in reality or context or something. I think we need to understand all that. I, I think we can link certainly the Steery and some of the other ones with, you know, walking paths, hiking paths, you know, biking, you know, just to say you can, you can ride a bike around the, 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 to the reservoir on the, uh, on the road and or go in the woods around there where uh, Dave Conti said we shouldn't go. Um, we can also, you know, access the hiking trails up into the mountain uh, and other, you know, whatever other parcels would let that kind of activity go on. Um, be it, uh, obviously you're not gonna be able to, you know, walk through the, uh, the golf course because uh, they're gonna frown on you walking on the green. So that part's not gonna work. And, what Dave Conti was saying about the uh, the reservoir proper, you know, just walking around there or biking around there, there's a lot of wetland in there. There's a lot of rock. There's, uh, you know, the endangered species. I, I don't think you can actually put any more trails of any kind in there without jumping on all that uh, stuff that's, uh, it's, it's, it's in the ground now. Uh, you know, it, it's pretty wet around there. Um, and I'm sure Jeff uh, can acknowledge that as well. Uh, even where Dave was saying by the, uh, by the, uh, the, 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 the country club, I mean, you look in there, there's, there's vernal pools and wetland and, you know, there's brooks flowing down through there. I mean, and it's a lot lower than the road that you go up to 141 on and it's a lot lower than, the property that uh, the country club is on. So I'm not sure how well that would work out for even putting a, you know, a, a nature path in. 
Well, I think that's the kind of thing that we're, we're really charged with reporting on. And uh, the question really is, how do you want to go about arriving at the way we will report? So, so I like Kip's suggestion, and, and again, Harry made it initially, but I, I don't think you, you know, many have said it already, I don't think we can just look at the, the, the reservoir proper. And even though Dave said it's pretty well protected, I think he said, if, if I heard him correctly, there are about 250 acres that, that, the, um, that the water department owns. I, I may be wrong on that. And he said 110 acres of that are water surface. Generally, you need a whole watershed. To, so, that, so that 250 acres does not protect that, that right. water source. Uh, you know, you need the whole, you need to protect the whole watershed. So you need at least 10 times the surface area. So, so we know we have to go out further than that. It's just a matter of, you know, do we, do we study that further area or do we also make recommendations related to that, to those other adjacent properties that, that therein is a little bit of a. Or, or, or does some information exist somewhere in some form or format that someone could come talk to us about that could at least um, make us more knowledgeable or give us some direction because otherwise, you know, we could be spinning our wheels and, you know, uh, looking at a lot of stuff that to, uh, isn't going to be important ultimately. Question, I don't know. Well, let me drag you back to my earlier point. How do you want to char uh, go charging after this? Do we want to identify the parcels and ask people to come in and talk about their parcels? Do we want to get a map up on a wall and uh, identify the individual parcels? And I'd love to get a map on a wall. Yeah. I'm just a planner. <laughs> Maybe all of the above. Yeah. So, so in reference to your question, I'm just curious: do we do we need to first kind of agree on what you know what our, what we feel our objectives are? Again, we have a charge from the from the city council, but you know, do we feel like we need to investigate before we can even decide what we want to do, or do you think we can frame? what we would try to answer through a study and a series of recommendations. It, it seems like, you know, are we in a position based on what we know to at least lay out what we might envision our, pro, our, 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 our final product from our committee's work being? Can we, can we talk about that? You know, what the final, go ahead. I'm I think that's here. a great idea. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think that's what Sue said. So uh, maybe echoing a little bit of, of, of the approach that I talked about in the first meeting, um, but I think it goes to, to Sue Ellen's question. The way I, I would normally approach it in my, in, in, in my planning world is having a scope of work, right? And we're, we're going to have to also decide who's going to execute the scope of work. Right now, you know, recognize that we're about nine uh, nine volunteers. Some of us are city staff, uh, right? Um, but, but for the purposes of this commission, we're, we're nine volunteers. No matter what we investigate, it's going to have to be written up in a report in a single voice. There's going to have to be maps, um, graphics, you know, what have you, so that we can properly communicate this. Our deliverable won't only be these, these meetings and these deliberations, right? So someone's going to have to do that work um, and if it's not directly city staff, which I imagine is less likely, it's probably, we're probably going to have to hire someone to do that. Right? Um, regardless of that, I, I think we need to put a scope of work in writing, even if it's just for this commission, right? Even so that it, we, we all look at it and so, and go yay or nay. Um, that's based off of the ordinance as been discussed here, 
but that specifically says what questions are we going to answer and where where are we going to get that answer so that we have our own checklist that says okay we have we answered this yes or no do we have a recommendation on this yes or no you know, sometimes you just don't have enough information to make a recommendation but we have our our map in turn not not our graphic map right like geographic map but our our our, our we're tracking our pathway to see have we have we done our diligence on point a on point b on point c but i think it starts with that scope um i shared as a model um after the first meeting a scope of work that we used on the mount tom power plant closure and, and investigation obviously very very different uh scenario there uh, but in the hopes that we could, you know, potentially draft something that provides a framework to draft the scope that we would say, these are the questions we want to answer. So at, at some point, that, that would be my suggestion, getting, getting something in writing. Anybody yeah. else? Yeah, I would just, I, I would add, I, I mean, I, I agree um, with Marcos's suggestion of developing a scope of work or basically an outline of what um, this committee's report will look like. Um, I would, I, maybe it's stating the obvious, but I'll do it anyway. You know, I would think that maybe the first step would be, um, you know, uh, a current conditions, like what what do we have here? What are the pieces? What are they currently um, being used as? And, um, and, and then, you know, including the abutters, like the golf courses and Mount Tom and, um, and then maybe what is if we did nothing what are these properties going to look like in 20 years you know and um or 50 years if nothing if we have if the city has no input it's just organically what's going to happen um and then maybe there's a what do we really want it to look like you know what would be what and and and, and is that achievable and um you know I, and i think that i'm trying to keep in my mind that um you know, I think part of our charge is to look at, um, you know, the reservoir um, as as uh, an asset, it's a jewel, um, an asset as a passive recreation. Um, clearly, it's an asset as, um, you know, as a potential backup water supply to either surrounding communities or to the city itself. Um, but also, are there things that we can do incrementally um, that might, uh, create some additional value. And I know that this is a terrible example, um, but you know, is there like a, a water bottling opportunity there? Um, again, I don't believe that there is, but I'm just trying to say like, that's the kind of value creation that, um, that might be more short term than, uh, you know, a comprehensive land use plan. Um, but it's a component of it, right? So I think that these are these different, my view is like existing conditions, um, uh, you know, and then if nothing happens, maybe it's existing conditions plus organic, and then a third, um, you know, what really kind of creative input things could we do to try to craft uh, an ultimate, you know, plan for that property that is achieving all of these goals, protecting the water, but you know, um, expanding the, the asset for the community. So, and what are the, what are the obstacles to that? Right. I mean, I think in my mind and, you know, I keep seeing as a big obstacle there, um, you know, parking and access to it. Um, you know, I see people running across route 141 regularly. I hold my breath every time I drive up that road. Um, so, you know, are there, are there things like that? You know, that would be a part of a maybe an enhanced plan for what we do. So, I mean, that's my input, you know, and I'll uh, take this opportunity just to say also um, at the last meeting, you asked me um, to check and see whether CPA funds could be used to, um, to fund a study. And um, 
The short answer is yes. Um, you know, uh, as long as what you're studying is, is projects that are uh, qualify for CPA funding, but passive recreation does. So as long as that's even part of the study, and it doesn't mean it has to, you have to implement the study. Um, you know, the other thing is, out of the CPA funds, I've been thinking, you know, there might be some things we could do there in the short term, um, you know, to improve the property. And, and because I'm lazy, I thought about, you know, something like benches around the reservoir, you know, CPA money can be used for things like that. Um, so that's it. That's my two cents for the meeting. Okay. Anybody else? All right, well, in listening to everybody, obviously we need to know a little bit more about the land laws. And obviously we need to talk about each of the surrounding properties, at least briefly, so we know how big they are and what their present usage actually is. And then we have to take the concerns of the water department and discuss those a little further so that everybody is on board with the conservation issues as well as the resource issue. Am I making sense? Yep. Okay, so if we go to law at the next meeting and say talk about a couple of the adjacent properties um, I did not make notes about what they all were. How about if we each took one or two of them and would be prepared to, in a minute or less, talk about that piece of property, how big it is and what its present use is. How does that sound? Yep. Present sure. use and possibly existing protections. Right. Good point, yeah. So I'll volunteer for Wyckoff. <laughs> I, I, I think, Sue, so for a minute, if you go back to what Marco said, I, I think it's all there. I think it's all there, right? I think that uh, ownership, size of the parcel, uh, conservation, rec uh, uh, re conservation uh, what do you call them, have to be, restrictions have to be, uh, they're legal. I, th I think they're all on on the website uh, of that the city uses uh, as now that I would defer to him, but I think it's all there unless the ownership has changed and none of it has recently. Most of that will be there. Um, some things are on the uh, some conservation restrictions are are specified in the in the deed, so that would require going into okay that's different. into the registry uh sometimes the restrictions are based on on policy right so if u.s fish and wildlife owns it there is uh there's policy governing that um as as jeff said um if if uh, dcr the, the, you know, the state owns it that, that has a, another set of regulations so so some of it is not on the map but certainly ownership uh size you know, zoning restrictions, land use restrictions, that, that would be there. Um, it, there's not a lot of different zoning there. So um, I think it's like two zones in that area. Okay, well, we're back to how do you all want to handle this? And I would like at this point to point out to everybody that we are, as has been said a couple of times, all volunteers. The city council has given us a charge specifically to look at the reservoir and its future within Holyoke and possibly Holyoke's needs, although I didn't hear that. Um, but they certainly did not provide us with the funding to hire anybody or to move forward with an expensive product. Correct. And I would like to remind everybody that we are sitting here purely as volunteers without the ability to access a city website for people to write to us on because those are all used up and the city isn't buying any more email addresses. We're using my Zoom because 
there's no availability at the city Zoom for when we can meet. And I'm happy to do it. But we're not given any funding or staffing to do any of this. So while you are thinking about how you want to proceed, let me remind you, as, as I think grandmother in this group, don't bite off more than you can chew. Yep. Mm -hmm. don't, don't volunteer to do something you don't want to do yourself. Precisely. So if we're going to look at all of these properties and see how they play into a Holyoke recreational package, which I think we are all coming to understand is going to be at least 85% passive recreation. We need to do this in small chunks to pull it into a large whole package that we can wrap up, tie with a pretty bow and hand to the city council without um, costing the city funding that it hasn't given us. Yes, well, and I would agree with that. And just, you know, from my vantage point, the awkwardness is I'm, 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 I'm soon to depart the position. I would say, you know, from what I would like to take on myself, if I was remaining in the position, I think this is, this is primed uh, to have an actual planning process with the support of the Office of Planning and Economic Development and potentially the Conser Conservation Sustainability Director. This is a really fun project, right, to support. And oftentimes what you would have in the bureaucracy or what's absent from the bureaucracy is a body like this that could serve kind of like a board of directors. So um, it's worth a conversation potentially with the mayor to see if there are uh, human resources that he could dedicate to the effort uh, and then secure some state resources for this. There are there are planning grants available um, often that you know this is this is one of the things that that's that staffers do and that and that's the only reason why I keep bringing this back, not because I think this this group should go back to the council and ask for for local dollars for this, although certainly it seems like a possibility with CPA, but th there are programs to fund things like this and and it is. Um, it, it is a great unresolved kind of kind of planning process that I think is is um, is mature to come to come to fruition at this point. So, so you can't appoint somebody, Marcos, as your last act. You know, you know. Come on, <laughs> where's your legacy? Come on. I, I think he was appointed. <laughs> <laughs> if the rumors I'm hearing are true. Um, you know, that might be the package that we're going to go back to the city council with. So it's something to think about it. Should we be running short um, paragraphs on what the surrounding activities presently are, what the needs for the water department are, how the reservoir is being used, and the fact that for the future of Holyoke, this needs a significant uh, planning and coordination effort. And therefore, we would recommend to the city council that they add to the planning department some sort of um, planning staff member who can handle this for the future. I mean, that might be the answer that we are going to wind up with. I don't know, but I'm hearing it everywhere. Yeah. That could easily be a recommendation from this group. Yeah, it, it, it's so exactly right. Having tried to link all that once, once long ago with, with, with a better time to have done it then, it, it was insurmountable at the time. It, it just just tripping over ourselves all the time and with a good group too. Yep. So for the purposes of minute taking, <laughs> I just want to clarify that what we're talking about possibly doing is going back to the city council and requesting some resources to perform our charge. Is that right? I don't. I don't think we're there 
Yeah, I don't think we said that. I think that what we said was we need to understand um, the property, the adjacent uses, figure out what is within the um, the impact of those properties, adjacent properties, um, potential impact of those properties. And, you know, the recommendation could be that the city take on this larger cycle planning process, conservation planning process, not that we're gonna hire a planning firm to come in and do this. Okay. So I, I, I heard I get that Marcus right? also, I heard Marcos also say something different, and that was, you know, uh, you know, Sue Ellen mentioned the possibility of going back to the council, but Marcos mentioned the possibility of going to the mayor and, and asking for, because this is, has so many planning components that we ask for maybe, I mean, what, what we clearly need is, is somebody to help at least staff, you know, coordinate this a little bit. And, you know, that's at least one department take this partially on. And so, you know, I, I do think that's, Madam Chair, worth considering, you know, maybe going to have a discussion with the, the outgoing planning director and the mayor, maybe the chair go and, and have a conversation to see if there might be at least a staff person that could help with this and, and see whether it's important enough for planning to, to help um, see what we're doing. What do you think? Jeb, I don't want to step on toes. It's the one thing that I worry about. Um, I mean, I don't mind what I say to somebody if I'm thinking a certain way, but I don't want to take something to the mayor when the charge has come from the city council. So the council has no resources, right, to provide us. Right? No, so. but they're the ones that should go to the mayor, I would think, for the resources if they really want this done in a big way. If what they are simply asking us to do is go to the general public, say, what ideas do you have for uses of the reservoir? For us to then evaluate all of those ideas for uses, come back with why they are or aren't good ideas, we can do that with no staff at all. Mm -hmm. If they want a thoroughgoing, coordinating study where parks and recs is part of it because we are talking about city recreational facilities and parks. Uh, if they want conservation part of it because of conservation law and wetlands, if they want the water department part of it because obviously the specific land we're charged with belongs to the reservoir, if they want to coordinate with private citizens, then they need the planning office for sure. And so it's a question of scope of the charge. I read it as much more narrowly than oh. any of the rest of you. Um, and I'll go wherever the majority wants to go. But I think we've got to go back to the uh, city council. Terry, you've got something to say. Yeah. I um, just from my perspective, I would agree with what you just said. Um, sorry, I opened this can of worms. Like, what are we doing? Um, because I'm really frightful that this will turn into a big, long project, and, and it should. But me as the Park and Recreation Director, I, I don't have that kind of time or expertise to dedicate. So I agree. I think follow the charge we were given with the original order. The land around us and it, around it and what possibly could happen I think as this committee would probably have to end there and as a city employee um, ownership is very important because you're right I don't want to step on the water department toes any more than I want the water department to come in and, and tell park and rec what to do so you're very right about that recommendations advisory yes but to what extent from my perspective it's an important perspective. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, gang, where do you want to go? I think Marlene had it right with um, just again, my perspective. Let's see what is around the what areas and parcels are around around the reservoir. And take it from there. And I, I would really keep it um, simple or narrow like you had yeah. asked. It should That's be simple and narrow. Point. Yeah, at this point. Now, how would you go about organizing, looking at those parcels surrounding the reservoir? Um, I have a thought maybe um, I would volunteer that I would talk to some people that I know at Tie and Bond uh, who have a terrific blog of all that kind of information and ask if they would provide me for you, for us, uh, such, a, such a thing, okay? A map, uh, I, a, little, a little further than Marcos talked about, whatever they have, and they may say no, but I'd be happy to ask. I think that would be great. I do too. Okay. And, um, and I think we can have the person from the law department maybe talk to us. And those should be the next two people we talk to. Or the next pieces of information we look at. All right. Would you like to do that for the meeting on the um, two weeks from today, the 19th? I'll certainly know whether I can get anything by then for sure. Okay, and I'm also fairly certain that Jeff can pull that Mount Tom study from the Conservation Commission by then. Yeah, I will, I will, I will get a hold of the Mount Tom study and, and share that. Yeah, I think it's quite large, quite lengthy, but if we can get a copy to Jeff, um, he would put it on that file for us and we would all have the opportunity to skim through it. I, I've downloaded a copy of the Conway School Report, too, already. Great. Right, take a look at that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then our next meeting will be same time, same station, Tuesday the 19th. First item will be the Law Department to include conservation law at the state and city level as well as what the Conservation Commission does. Uh, and then we will talk with uh, Dave and his presentation with what Ty and Bond has for us. And hopefully we will all have read the Mount Tom study as well coming through on the, um, the file that Jeff Anderson Burgo set up for us. Does everybody know how to get onto that file? I will ask him to send that information out to everybody again tomorrow. Okay. 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 Anything okay. further for tonight? No, Sue Ellen, no should I call Crystal? I'm sorry, say again, Marlene. Do you want me to call Crystal? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Hey, uh, Kip, did, I just have a question for Kip, after, you know, um, related to the minutes. Are you gonna- Go ahead. Have a format, you have a format for those that we're gonna use from here on out, or did you use Jeff's? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's the other thing. Who's gonna, who's gonna get stuck with the uh, minutes for the next meeting? Not me. Not me. I'm busy. <laughs> I, got uh, 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 I will handle them. I'll handle them for the next meeting. But okay, okay. But but Jeff, to answer your question, um, a format. I don't. I don't have a. I don't have a template for meeting. But, again, you know, if we're going to have to do it this way, it might be nice to just have it like up on the Google Doc, and we just can do a continuous. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so we can just let, let me just suggest that you take the agenda, put the broad topics in that were discussed under each agenda item, and let the, uh, the cloud handle the rest. Got it. Yeah. I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> I'm, now, I'm now speaking as, as in my former professional life. 
I think that's the easiest way to do it from a management uh, management position. Well, okay, may I have a, a motion to adjourn? Yes, I'll move to adjourn after first saying thank you, Madam Chair. This was you know to thank you, uh, shepherd us through <laughs> these thank beginnings. You. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Second. Happy New Year. See you guys in a couple of weeks. Back to everybody uh, in a few days. See ya. If I'm not, Jeff will be. Good night. Night. Good night. Good night. night.